So good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for coming tonight on what well, we're coming to the close of our annual HCHC Missions Week. We have this event tonight with Pamela offering her reflections on her 14 years as a missionary. Tomorrow night, we're going to have a beautiful movie. How many of you have ever seen the movie The Mission with Robert De Niro? Oh, a few of you. Good. So if, if you haven't seen it, it's a fabulous movie. So come tomorrow evening in the theater and you can watch the video as well. So I want to welcome everyone. This is the annual EFOM Mission Lecture. EFOM is the Endowment Fund for Orthodox Missions, which was an endowment fund started probably 40 years ago from the Annunciation Church in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And the Annunciation Church in Lancaster had a vision of wanting to try to help the students at Hellenic College and Holy Cross better understand and get motivated and inspired to our call of mission. Mission isn't simply something that some people in our church do. It's an essential aspect of who we are as Orthodox Christians. Of course, we all know the last commandment Jesus said was, all authority on heaven and earth I have, and with that authority, I command you, go and make disciples of all nations. Go out and share the good news to all of the creation. And he even said, I will empower you. The, Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and empower you so that you can be witnesses in Judea, Samaria, uh, um, Jerusalem, uh, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So it's not simply a call for some people. It's an, a part of who we are. Archbishop Anastasius of Albania, he says, it is in the DNA of the church to be engaged and involved in witnessing your faith locally, here in America, wherever your local context is, nationally, as well as across cultures throughout the world. So. The Annunciation Church in Lancaster, 40 years ago, they established an endowment fund, and they had four goals of this endowment fund. What the first goal was to sponsor an annual lecture. And over the last 40 years, the endowment fund has brought some of the greatest missionaries of the Orthodox Church, Archbishop Anastasius of Albania, uh, Metropolitan Sotirios of Korea, and then Metropolitan Ambrosius of Korea, uh, Archbishop Makarios of Kenya, Bishop Thomas de Klee of Sierra Leone, Father Andres Yiron, who was the founder of the Orthodox Church movement in Guatemala, people from Project Mexico, from different parts of the world over the years. So the Endowment Fund would bring speakers to offer an annual lecture. And the ultimate goal of the Endowment Fund was, was to establish a chair or, or an institute of mission, which 12 years ago was established here at Holy Cross, the Mission Institute of Orthodox Christianity, which is now sponsoring this Mission Week. So anyway, I'm glad that all of you are here to experience this year's Endowment Fund speaker, Pamela Barksdale. She's a graduate of Hellenic College, Holy Cross. All of you have heard her already speak several times in the chapel. Some of you are at a Bible study she led last night where the first night on Monday night she was sharing about some of her experiences today. She's going to reflect. I asked her, she just completed 14 years as a missionary. When I had served in Albania, I had come back after 10 and a half years. And at that time, when I came back in 2004, I was the longest, probably the longest ever missionary from the Orthodox Church in, in the United States, having served 10 and a half years. Um, but now we have people like Pamela, who served 14 years. We have another recent missionary who just came back, Georgia and Anastas Bendo. And how long was Georgia? 18. Georgia was there for 18 years. We have Nathan Hoppy, who's a graduate of our school, who's now been in Albania for around 23 years, serving as a, a cross-cultural missionary. And then we have other people, Stefanos Ritzi, who's going on probably close to 10 years and, uh, and other missionaries who are out there serving the church. So one of the things that I want us to be challenged with is 
reflecting yourself on whether God is calling you to possibly leave the comforts of your home experience and offering yourself to say, Lord, here I am. Do you have needs elsewhere in the world? Maybe greater, we have needs in America, but maybe there are greater needs in other challenging places around the world. And not only can you offer yourself to God, but you will be deeply enriched and blessed through your experience. So we invited Pamela to come and to share and to reflect upon her 14 years as a missionary, to share the joys, the excitement, the blessings, as well as the challenges that you face in any context of mission and in any context of ministry, but especially that come maybe in cross-cultural mission. So we welcome Pamela back to her home here at Helena College Holy Cross. Uh, we thank God for her 14 years of experience. We pray that God continue to bless her as she continues her ministry. Coming back, she isn't coming back to retire, but she's come back to the States, and now she just recently began working for the Orthodox Christian Mission Center, and she begins in a new, new ministry of trying to help the local parishes, especially in the West Coast, embrace their call to mission. So we welcome you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Father. It really is a joy to be back here at Holy Cross Hellenic College, where I spent five years um, as a student and working at the press and felt like I was part of the community. So um, I thank you very much for all of you being so welcoming this past few days. And I've really enjoyed meeting all of you. As I was preparing for my talk tonight, and I reflected back on my experience and some of maybe the life lessons I learned in Albania, I've tried to put those words, those lessons together in words and pictures, which I hope you will find meaningful. Father Luke asked me to say something about myself and what brought me to the mission field and the challenges I faced, and, and that's difficult. I love the mission field and my work, but I really don't like talking about myself. <laughs> so you'll forgive me if I take some shortcuts in my story. Um, when I came to Holy Cross in 1984, I had been a convert to the Orthodox faith for about five years. I was your typical convert in that I was reading everything and asking lots and lots of questions. I was an older student, but that year many students were coming to the School of Theology, leaving career, second careers, bringing their families with them. Uh, Father Jim Ritalis was a soil, a soil scientist. There were mechanical engineers and physicists and even a rocket fuel scientist. Um, there were lots of mission students from Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Ghana, and Father Daniel Biantoro, the very first Indonesian Orthodox, began the school that year. Very quickly, the Lord directed me towards the campus, campus missions committee and set the course and direction of my life. His eminence, Metropolitan Ilya Katri of blessed memory, was our dean of students and our missions committee advisor. The other students like myself were excited to bring the message of Christianity to the world. And many are leaders in the mission efforts today, like Father Martin Ritzi, who's head of the Orthodox Christian Mission Center, or Father George Lyakopoulos, who's been the board president and a board member for years. Um, Father Andrew Barakas, who's really very active in the Scottsdale, Arizona area. Um, there's other people that aren't there, like Father Jerry Markopoulos up in the Northwest. The African students who returned home to become leaders in the Orthodox Church in Kenya and Uganda. And then I was, I was really involved. I think one year I was even the president, maybe my last year was president of the missions committee because we were really active. And I've been asking everybody, are you doing anything with the Philoxenia house? Are you, uh, we had a carpool where we loaned our cars out for students to get to their jobs back and forth. We, we really were a fellowship 
within the missions committee. So, but then one summer my life changed and I was asked to be the driver for His Grace Bishop Hierasimus of Abydos. That summer there were no male students on campus that had a car, so I was, I was fortunate enough to be, help him grocery shop and go to his appointments. And he became my mentor and my friend. And I found myself touched by his grace. He was so kind and gentle and a truly holy person. I came here with a deep sadness because two years prior, my sister had been tragically killed. And I couldn't seem to get past that. But after I met him, slowly that sadness began to disappear. And it gave way to an inner joy. And I know it came from his prayers. And I learned how God's grace and being in the presence of a holy person can lift us up and help us grow closer to Christ. <laughs> Metropolitan Elia Katri was Father Elia Katri in those days. And he was the first person to introduce me to the Orthodox Church. Uh, once the missions committee was doing a fundraising, I don't know, Father Ray, if you remember this, we had something. And so we brought Father Leah the money, and he put it on the table. We put it on the table, and Father Patrick said, well, how do you want to do this? You want to do this the American way or the Albanian way? And we said, What's the Albanian way? And he took the money off the table, put it in his pocket, and I'll, sell it. Said, I'll tell you later how much there was. <laughs> and that was my first introduction to Al Albania. <laughs> 20 years later, when we met again in Albania, he was a bishop and dean of the Theological Academy, and I was there to teach Christian education. He was a supportive friend, and I was so grateful for a familiar face to guide me in my new ministry, and he's the one who directed me towards really focusing my efforts on Christian education in the rural villages, which became um, a focus of my work as a religious educator. Um, it all seemed to be part of God's plan honestly didn't know in 1984 or could I have imagined that one day I would serve as a missionary in Albania and work directly for Bishop Katri, Metropolitan Ilia, or also be given the opportunity to work directly with his great, his beatitude, Archbishop Anastasius Yanolatos as his research assistant. I'm still in awe and wonder that the Lord blessed me with this experience and I often say, I'm a spoiled child of God. <laughs> After graduation in 89, I returned to California and became the diocese volunteer because they didn't know what to do with women with the <laughs> Masters of Divinity <laughs> degree in those days. So um, I served as a co-chair for the Bay Area Spiritual Renewal Committee, a Sunday school teacher, and a youth director in my parish in 91. I went on the first teaching team to Kenya and Uganda, and in 92, I co-chaired the Russia Challenge Movement for the Diocese of San Francisco. And that was in response to the collapse of communism and the needs of the church there. We filled a 747 airplane with thousands of boxes of food that kept a lot of people alive that very cold winter. And in the summer, I was part of a 22-person pan-Orthodox team to the Ukraine that distributed Bibles and catechetical materials and medical supplies. After this, His Grace Bishop Anthony said, well, I see you have some administrative abilities. <laughs> so he appointed me as the executive director of St. Nicholas Ranch at a time when they were really going through a transition. And I was there for two years, and that was the end of my mission work once I was there. <laughs> so it was 20 years before the door in my life would open again to missions. And I found myself on this path. I was 60 years old, but it didn't matter. I was really much more prepared than I would have been 30 years before to be a missionary. 
and I was going to work for an archbishop that was 20 to 25 years older than I was <laughs> and had more energy than most 20 years old, 20 year olds who were working for him. So my life lesson I came away from this was if the Lord has prepared some work for you to do, it really doesn't matter if, like Jonah, you go down to the harbor and you get on the boat going someplace else. Because eventually, the opportunity will come around again. And it did. And this time, I recognized that this was the path that the Lord had meant for me to be on. And my work and my calling to mission service has been my greatest joy. It has been a path that's been full of grace and friendship and love, as well as tribulations and challenges. And I found my theological education was only one of my many talents and skills I needed. A missionary must be a messenger, and a missionary must be a fundraiser. In truth, um, that was very difficult to accept. Um, but don't, don't feel too comfortable out there because even though you become priests and have a salary from your church community, you will not be immune from the need to fundraise. But for most missionaries, our life is that of accepting poverty and sacrifice, and we have to ask for help. Um, I found this so difficult, and um, but then I found out that his Beatitude Archbishop Anastasios, in order to rebuild all of Albania, had gone to all the Orthodox churches all over the world and Europe and the um, many different places, and he'd called himself a holy beggar, and he'd raised money to rebuild all those churches. So I felt humbled by my own pride, and. As scripture says, we need to ask. We need to ask, seek, and knock. And once I learned this, many things became easier. So missionaries are sent out for two-year periods, and then they have to go back home and raise some more money for their next two years. So after two years, I was told, we're going to have to go home, and you're going to have to raise your money. And if you don't raise all of your money, you can't come back until you finish fundraising. And I said, what? So I went to the archbishop and I said, oh, I have classes, I'm teaching. I can't be gone indefinitely. I, I have to, what am I gonna do? And he said, don't worry. You don't know where the money will come from, but it will come. So I went home on my first fundraising tour and I went around and when I came back, he called me into his office and he said, so Pamela, how did it go? And I said, I raised my money. It was like the Holy Spirit was at my back. And he said, oh, you of little faith. <laughs> I learned a very important lesson. If you're doing the Lord's work, he will provide for your needs. Maybe not everything you want, but certainly what you need. Today, having served as a missionary in Albania, I was involved in so many different ministries. And I'm still amazed that the Orthodox Church in Albania is a 2,000-year-old church, and yet it is once again a first-generation church faced with all the challenges of every new church, the need for churches, clergy, ministry, books, catechetical materials, an educated laity, and people to carry the message of God's love as a lived reality into the community. This is a, a, an OCMC team that came to Albania to do a camp. And we did it in a, the historic site of Apollonia in an old, it's, it's really a museum, but they allowed us to use it for our camp. And it was so awesome to think that I was in a, a place from the first century and we were there were all these children coming to be part of it. We not only had the Home of Hope children, but we had children from the local area that came to the camp. Um, so my next lesson was that 
Miracles still happen. When I was getting ready to go to Albania, everybody was saying, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. So then somebody said to me, why do you want to go to Albania? I said, because there's miracles taking place there, and I want to go and see it, and I want to be part of it. And so the miracle that's happening there is that in one generation, under extreme persecution, the church officially ceased to exist. When his, arch, when his Beatitude Archbishop arrived in Albania, he found broken pieces of churches. He found lots of rocks and rubble, and he used them to build new churches and schools and began restoring from what we term ground zero, the Orthodox Church of Albania. In 1967, the Komsomol wa walked the youth group, the Komsomol is a youth group of the Communist Party, up the hill to the historic and um, very beloved church of Shindlash, monastery of Shindlash, and they destroyed it. And they burned the books. This is just a clip out of a video that they took. They made a picture of themselves doing it. Um, and they burned the books, they destroyed everything, they just took it apart completely. And so when, when I, I kept seeing all these just haunting images of the devastation, and they really, they really spoke something to my soul, and that was part of why I wanted to go. And I kept thinking about the, the words from the Agustus of Thanksgiving. No one can put together what is crum crumbled into dust, but thou canst restore a conscience turned to ashes. Thou canst restore it to its former beauty, a soul lost and without hope. With thee there is nothing that cannot be redeemed. Thou art love, thou art creator, thou art redeemer. And so, I could see the transition of what had been done. There were 1,600 churches before communism. There was nothing when the archbishop arrived. You can see the ragged piece of vestment. Those are the relics of St. John Vladimir. They'd hidden them. Um, when they were excavating the historic monastery of um, St. Cosmos at Delos, they found, they found his, his tomb, and they found his relics. And the icon said, the monk, Cosmos at Delos. And um, so they were, they were rebuilding, restoring. I mean, the youth were over there digging that monastery out of the mud when they found the relics of the saint. So, but there, was a, there were these secret Christians that were left alive that had managed to hide their faith from the communists. And I found so many stories of people telling me how they had icons in their closets or they'd have a secret liturgy or Papa Yanni, who was working in a metal factory, would make crosses and leave them in the broken stones of monasteries for other Christians to find. Uh, they were really incredible stories of faith. And so there was just, when the archbishop got there, there were no functioning churches, and there were 22 clergy left alive. This is one of the, this is the church you just saw a few slides back. That's that church, restored. And so many new churches have been built. That's another story. So from Shinvlash, from this wall there with the horse, that's the, that was all that was left after they finished tearing down the monastery of Shinvlash. Just that one standing wall. And unfortunately, in the recent earthquake in 2019, it cracked and it had to be completely torn down. We couldn't even keep that anymore. So, but the whole 
part of that part of the monastery is almost completely restored now. So the next time you go to Albania with Father Luke someday, <laughs> you'll be able to see it again. But what the Archbishop did was he laid the foundation for the resurrection of Christ theological school, which was, became the resurrection of the Church of Albania on that site. And that's where he built the theological academy and started educating and eventually ordaining priests. And that is uh, the one on the left is the, is the theological school and monastery. And the right picture is the um, skiti from the back looking this way. There's a, a little uh, convent for nuns, the myrrh-bearing women. So you have two different angles and actually two different times time frames, but, um, and that's where I taught. And that was, it was a privilege really to be part of that story where there were no clergy. There are now today almost 200. There was about maybe 160 at the time of this picture, but I think there's like 185 this year. And this was our clergy laity. Um, several years after I got there. I'll, I'll show you the picture from the clergy laity in just a minute this year as they celebrated their 30th anniversary. Now we talked about peaceful religious coexistence the other night in the chapel and how this forging of this dialogue among the clergy who had been all been persecuted, they were able to get a, a really important um, article into the Constitution that allowed religious freedom, the right to choose and change religion without penalty. It's one of the few predominantly Muslim countries that can do that. And as I said in chapel, that was monumental for the mission there, and it is still monumental for the mission. Um, the next lesson that I learned from my life in Albania was the importance of the Great Commission. And Father Luke explained that to you many times, and I, I think I explained it. But the Archbishop had this beautiful mosaic icon made for the Cathedral of the Resurrection. And it's in the altar it stands so that you can see it right above the altar table. And people uh, say, oh, it's an icon of the ascension, but it's not. You see, his feet are still touching the ground. So it's that moment before he ascends into heaven where he says, all, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go to all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. Now, a lot, sometimes people just forget some parts of that. And, you know, we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We bring people into the life of the Holy Trinity. And you can't really baptize somebody until you catechize them. You really need to know that you have, need to have an educated laity, and they need to know and believe and have faith. So I, I've said to so many people at the meals, really, you need Christian education. You need to know how to teach. It doesn't matter if you are a liturgist celebrating liturgy. You will still need to know how to teach. So. At OCMC, this is our, our mission statement. This is our goal. We are under the uh, oops, canonical assembly of bishops. And our vision is to make disciples of all people, to bring them, everyone into the church, into the body of Christ. 
Now, Albania was the first place I ever saw this inside a church. And I've never seen it inside a church prominently displayed anywhere else. And I asked this the other night. Have you ever seen it inside a church? Do you, the icon of the Great Commission. Come out to my church in Webster. In your church? I didn't see it. I was there. I missed it. Ah, okay. I believe you, but um, anyway, it's very few. But it's because he's a missionary. At, yeah. Yeah. Um, in Albania, I learned this important lesson that mission really is an integral part of the life and history of our church. But somehow, over the course of time, that focus has been lost. Today, there are those who still see missions as and evangelism as a Protestant innovation or as proselytization. But they fail to grasp the missionary history of the Byzantine Empire and the guiding principles that have existed over centuries and millenniums. We have a pan-Orthodox mission center under the unifying authority of the Assembly of Canonical Bishops. And they have given the, us the directive to go and make disciples of all nations. Now, the vision of the assembly is that all Orthodox jurisdictions work together to fulfill the high priestly prayer of Jesus, that all may be one as you and I, Father, are one, are in me, and I in you, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe you have sent me. Now, I've been recently rereading a passage from our own resident saint, Bishop Gerasimus, in one of his last works, The Hierarchical Prayer of Jesus. And he comments on this passage from John 17, from this, um, that they all may be one. And he says, the prayer now embraces the church of all times, anticipating the preaching mission of the apostles and the faithful who would be added constantly to the church. The faithful of all nations, of all times, must be united and incorporated into the one body of Christ, the one people, the one kingdom of God, united among themselves with one mind, one heart, just as the Son is united to the Father. Only when people see Christians so united with faith and love will they believe that the church truly is the work of God. Then they will know that Christ is indeed the Son of God, sent by the Father for the salvation of the world. Then they will believe that we have eternal life. His grace, and this is the passage that really made me stop and, and really reflect on this. He said, The unity of the church and that of the whole world is the main concern of Christ as he is about to go to the cross for the salvation of the world. The unity of the world in faith and love. Before he was crucified, he is praying for the apostles that he is going to send out after the resurrection. Now, that means that he always foreknew and we have this victory that we have to take in our hands and accept that the victory has been won. Recapturing the apostolic spirit is what his beatitude Archbishop Anastasios has been talking about for the last 50 years, trying to rekindle that spark in the Orthodox Church throughout the whole world. He began in Greece, in and then went to the World Council of Churches and America and Europe and everywhere within the Orthodox Church. And my, my work as I got to Albania, I started, I really worried. I'm going to change the tone a little bit. I really worried about what I was going to do there. And what I found out was I was actually going to get to use my theological education 
and the um, special minor in religious education that Father Kalivas helped me write. And I got to put all of that to work in a very full and wonderful way with the classes at the Theological Academy and with all the many ministries that I was invited to participate in. This was my first class at Shinvlash at the Resurrection. And this was my last class. And they're all students like you. You can probably see yourself in their faces. When I went back and did a, a conference, we, we did daycare camps for village children. I'll go ahead. I created a resource center. I published children's literature, probably over 12 books, just that helped parents to talk to their children and have books to read to their children. And then we also provided Bibles and children's, liter children's books and uh, prayer books. We probably printed our children's prayer book now at least 7,000 times, reprinting and reprinting and reprinting. This was, when I went back in 18, I went and I did this. Um, I had gone home to take care of my mother for a little while. And so I did a conference for catechists. And there was about 100 students and people that had graduated. I was trying to do this for the graduates, the alumni, bringing them back. And um, there were more than 66 of my students who were actually working in the church, doing catechism programs, or had been ordained to deacons and priests and so forth. And I thought that that was pretty awesome. And I was really proud of them. But you had 60 of your students at that one conference you did? Yeah, they came. The, the, the alumni. That's great. And then the, the current students. So, they're, yeah, so yeah. And then my other. The other place my heart was with the Children's Home of Hope. This is the last team we just had last June. I'm God willing, you know, the COVID doesn't come back. I will take a team for another two weeks in June to the orphanage, and we will uh, do it a day and camp. Anything about the Children's Home of Hope? Right? The Children's Hope of Hope. It's located on the Schindlash campus. The Archbishop didn't think we should separate theology from pra practical philanthropy. So he placed this children's orphanage, or home for disadvantaged children. Um, some of them have one or two parent, one parent or a grandparent, but they ha they all come from difficult situations, and so they have my heart from the first time I saw them. <laughs> so one of the things you do and you're hoping to do is take a, a, a team of students, possibly, to go there. Right, and I've taken several names of people down who wanted me to keep them advised of that, um, if it's going to happen or not. And I have my little book with me. If you want to give me, you know, tell me you're interested, I'll be happy to um, give you as much information as I can. If OCMC doesn't do teams, and I don't do it through OCMC, Father Luke said I can try to do it through the institution. So here, the Missions Institute. So we hope that it will be able to do it. Um, the other, they have a girls camp, Shenyan Vladimir. This is the one that Father Luke planted. And I would be there every summer doing the training program with the camp counselors and uh, having fun with the girls, many of whom were my students at the academy. So it gave me a chance to really get to know them better. These girls were all my students at the academy, and they were all camp counselors. And um, it gave me a chance to really you know, bond with them a little more. And then I, we had campus ministry. Where, did you start this? Yeah, Father Luke started this. And they had a house dedicated to campus ministry where there were paid employees who were there many days of the week, and they, some, they had lectures, they had Bible studies, they had social gatherings. This was a retreat, and we, I introduced them to icebreakers, and this one was called Blinded by Money. So they had coins on their eyes, and they had to drop it in a bucket. 
if they could find a bucket, you know. So um, this was a, uh, the account, the person in charge of this actually was Nathan Hoppe, along with Anna Baba, a local girl, graduate of the academy, when I was there before it was fun, Luke. Um, but I had a regular Bible study that I did with the kids, you know. And then other things, other special projects that I did is I funded a, the catechism field work through grants, special project grants through OCMC. And this was just this past summer. This is Bishop Nicola. And, uh, he's just so blessed. He was baptizing not only kids, but adults and their families and so forth and out in fear in the ocean. So, uh, and he wants to do more. He said, this was really great. I want to do overnight camps. <laughs> he's so um, charismatic, I guess is the word to say. You know, he'll say to you, he'll say to a family in the church in the coffee hour, they now have coffee hour there at Shindlash, he'll say, oh, are you orthodox? Are you married? Are your kids baptized? Can I baptize your children? I mean, all in the same breath. <laughs> so... Um, they appointed me in 2018 the executive director of the Spirit of Love Foundation, which oversees 25 of the church private schools. Uh, 18 of those are preschools, 17 or 18 of them. And this was my staff, and this is with the archbishop. And uh, that was the most difficult challenge um, because it was back into the secular world. And it was really, even though it was within the church, the schools are accredited by the state, and you can't teach religion in the schools. You can have spiritual journey courses after school as an elective. And um, we, did not, we did not practice any kind of discrimination. So we had Orthodox, Muslim, and atheist families in our schools. So our program, we try to, focus on character education and character building so that the, and, and this is why people brought their children to the school. They assumed that this would be a place where their children would grow. Um, at the same time, they wanted privileges, <laughs> which made life challenging. So this, were, this was a conference we did before COVID with all of the teachers and so forth. And it was called How to Work with the Grace of the Holy Spirit in Our Programs. And I had two wonderful press professors from Greece who came and offered the program. And we had translators for those who didn't speak Greek. And the people from Eurocaster who spoke Greek were really excited <laughs> to have. Uh, but they were, they were really wonderful. And we did uh, work, breakout workshops and they tried to really look at themselves and interact and see how they could work together. It was the first time since the uh, foundation was started, about 25 years, that all the schools got together in one conference and saw themselves as one family of schools and not individual private schools. So it was an important thing. This was last Thanksgiving when the OCMC missionaries with Father Martin and Dan and Father Chris and President, they all came and we had Thanksgiving together. So you can see the um, Tirana team. There's lots of kids. So these are all the OCMC missionaries working in Albania? This, at that time, yes. Last Thanksgiving. So there's the Ritzies, there's the Serianises, the McDonald's, the Bendos, um, Nathan and Gabriella. And I'm in there someplace. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, OK. Yeah, there I am. Anyway. Um, and then there's um, Vasily, Evi, Mia, Zenia, and Daniel, and Moses and Ethan. So we have a lot of, you know. This is the thing that people really need to understand is missionaries go out as families. We don't just send single people out, or just a young married couple. There are many, especially in our new missions, like Fiji and Indonesia, there are many missionary families 
who are going out and taking their children with them and raising them in another country. Um, and then finally, I took this lesson away from Albania, which has to do with this peaceful coexistence and the fact that we live in a pluralistic society. And the lesson is that if we do not pass the faith along to the next generation, the church can die. It is not something that we can be uh, passive about. We need to keep, we have religious freedom here. We have the ability to share the faith. We have a fairly affluent society. And yet, our numbers are pre-COVID, 22% of the church is leaving. Now, 39% after COVID. We're not getting those people back in. And people are saying, well, new people are coming. People who weren't Orthodox before, it's true, but they're not making up the difference. We really have to understand how important it is that we continue to bring the next generation and the people outside the church into the church. I've lost, totally lost my way. <laughs> um, Before I began, began my mission, I had to take Father Luke's missionary class. And every one of you had to take that, or those of you who are his mission students. And if you go on a mission, then you're going to have to do it online. So, um, and I studied the lives. I'd already knew a lot about the Orthodox missionaries, but I studied more. And I saw that missions really is that integral part of the history and life of the church. And those, but there are those who still see missions as um, some kind of Protestant innovation. Or that if we tell people about our faith, we are proselytizing. And we fail to grasp the rich missionary history that's been around since the Byzantine Empire and those guiding principles that developed over centuries for evangelizing, not colonizing, all nations. We evangelize, we don't colonize. We teach in the language of the people. Very quickly, we raise up, as soon as possible, a local clergy and an administrative structure. We develop an authentic liturgical life, a life that's centered around the liturgy. And the continuation of that one holy Catholic and apostolic church that is universally connected to everyone everywhere, as I said last night, in Holy Communion. Now, the first apostles went out, and we know that they really tried to get to the entire ecumeni, the, the known world at that time. But we also see in the lives of the saints of the church that there are many missionaries who embrace Christ and witness their faith through service and some through martyrdom. We have Cyril and Methodius in the mission to the Slavs. They created a language for a people who didn't have a written language and then translated. And that has sown fruit a thousandfold. In the Russian mission, we have St. Innocent and St. Herman and so many of them who were in the far east of Russia and Alaska. And St. Innocent, you know, there's all these pictures that depicted of him paddling a kayak through icy water going like, you know, he was a hero at the time a really heroic figure of going out into Alaska and going through the icy waters, and that's why they elect, elected him the patriarch. We have St. Cosmos Adalos. He left the monastery, and he came down. He said, God's calling me, and he went to the villages 
in uh, Greece and Albania, and he stood on a bench in the middle of town, and he started telling them, God is love. And thousands of people followed him from village to village. He helped create the schools that helped the people maintain their faith. And they used that then also to spark the, re the revolution <laughs> and the fall of the Turkocratia. We have the Albanian mission. And we have the wisdom of Archbishop Anastasios' vision of one one mission, one purpose. There's only one jurisdiction in Albania. And every, all the Orthodox work together. He never allowed all the other churches to come in and establish their own separate churches. And they use Greek and English because the population has both. Um, there is, it's an autocephalous church, and although he came as an exarch of the Patriarchate. The people accepted him and voted him in as their primate, as the head of the church. And when he uh, goes to glory, there is a, a, an assembly of bishops that will elect from their local clergy or their local bishops a, a replacement for him. So that structure is there in that church. Um, and he continues to tell the message to everybody. It's not a question of can we, but an imperative command, we must. A missionary activity is not simply something useful or just nice, sorry, but something imperative. It's not simply obedience, duty, or altruism. It's an inner necessity that we participate in it. They say he's a living saint. I agree. Um, after, and I probably, Father Luke agrees. He has, uh, he sacrificed much. He suffered tremendously. And yet at 93, next week, he is still um, filled with the grace of the Holy Spirit and able to lead that country and inspire the people. So, oops, I went, where'd I go? Oops, so, last question. Here we are in the plurality of the American mission. And I've always liked this picture that was on the cover in the 1970s of the US News and Rural Report. And was it 70s or 80s, early 80s? Um, so we've had the Russian mission, the missionaries went to Alaska and the Far East, and also the merchants. And the missionaries kind of followed the merchants. merchants. We have the Greek Orthodox who came here as in immigrant communities, also the, the Russians and the Antiochians and many other nationalities. Um, we have the Orthodox Church in America, uh, came as Russian immigrants, and they declared themselves autocephalous from Moscow because of communism. And we have this fracturing of the body of Christ into all these different denominations. But then we have to ask ourselves, so what is the American mission? Is it the OCA? Is it the the Russians who started in Alaska and tried to spread out down through the rest coast? What is, who are we in this mission journey? What, where will we be in history? What will history say of us? History will say of Albania that the, that was a miracle that happened in 30 years. Think about it. From nothing to that living, vibrant church in 30 years. Here we've been here hundreds of years. Not all the immigrant churches have been here, but there's a challenge here. We have the possibility for unity among the Orthodox to work together. I'm not saying we can wipe out the jurisdictions. Please don't say I said that because <laughs> I'm, well, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. I'm saying that we have the potential 
to pool our resources with programs like OCMC and IOCC and OCF to work together in, in unity and in love to, to spread the truth of orthodoxy. And we, I, I believe that orthodoxy has the fullness of the truth and the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to share that with others. And so that's what I will continue to do. I will continue to pray. I will continue to work for unity among the churches. And I will continue to share the good news of God's love with people. And so, and I pray that you will do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela. I don't know, if, does anyone have any questions about anything that she presented, anything about the Church of Albania, about her life? Yes. Pamela, when did you want the uh, group, the two-week trip? Is that, that a summer? Yes, it's uh, set two weeks in October. I mean, I mean little, little, June. <laughs> this is October. Um, it, usually, school is over the middle of June, so we do those last two weeks in June. So you, how many students do you need from here? Um, anywhere from four to six or eight. I've had teams of 11. Four, you know, four small, six, because it's a lot of work. I had a team of six, but there were two children last summer, and they said I worked them really hard. But they, they realized that there, there were two children. So, so. so for everyone, if anyone's interested in possibly going to Albania in June for two weeks, and you'll, you'll go to the Home of Hope, working with Pamela and running a camp uh, in Albania. So consider that yeah. as a possibility. It's fun, and the kids are great, and they're the kind of children that you can't give them enough hugs. There just there aren't enough hugs in the world. Are there any other questions or any other comments? We want to thank Pamela very much for spending a week with us and sharing her experience. Where I, I know when you're a missionary serving overseas, you come back and you want to share your experiences a little bit. And the truth is, is not too many people are interested in hearing about your experiences. But it's nice to be here at the school where you had students who were engaged, interested. And uh, she told me she had many interesting conversations with different students. So thank you for spending the, the week with us. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And please come up and talk to Pamela if you have any information or you want to get her contact. If you want to give me your email and I can stay in touch with you, that's fine too. I'll go find a pen. So and if you I, haven't given it Dr. already, Dr. Petitas please. for being here. Fa uh, Father Philip, who, Father Philip, and Dr. Petitsis and I were on the first mission trip to Kenya back in 1987. And back then, I never dreamed that the three of us would have been here together. So it's <laughs> nice to have the, the three of us. Because we would get off away from the group and we'd go to the huts. Yeah. Right? Right? So please come in. There's some wine, coffee, some. Uh, Wine and uh, cheese and crackers. So please come in. Make it obvious. Thank you. I.